Hi, everyone. So we're really excited to be here. Um, uh, thanks for inviting us. Uh, so we'll be talking, like uh, I was mentioning, about some, some tests we've been doing with Kubernetes and reproducing um, what we've been doing. Do you have the clicker? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm Ricardo Rocha, and I'm a computer engineer in CERN IT. And I'm Lucas Heinrich. I work at the Atlas Experiment at CERN as a physicist. Right. So we'll come to the... Is this working? No? Yeah. Are we on the computer? Uh, maybe we'll just do it manually. Okay. Cool. So, uh, uh, so we'll quickly introduce the, the CERN. Um, CERN. So CERN is the uh, European research, uh, Organization for Nuclear Research. You probably heard about it. Uh, um, it's uh, uh, the biggest particle physics laboratory in the world. Uh, and we're based in Geneva, uh, Switzerland. So if you switch. OK, so we, we build a lot of experiments. Our main, main goal is to do fundamental research. Uh, to do this, we, we build very large experiments, and we try to answer big questions uh, about the universe. So we, we want to know uh, what is matter made of and uh, what happened just after the Big Bang, what was the state of matter just after the Big Bang. And this picture here is about one of the other things we want to uh, try to see is uh, what, what is antimatter and why don't we see antimatter in the universe. Uh, so in this uh, machine here, one of the big experiments we've built, uh, which is done just down the road from our offices, uh, we actually create antimatter and uh, we try to keep it for a while and try to see w w what is inside of it. But many of you, because this is a computing conference, might know CERN also for other reasons. And uh, one of the big uh, things we've done uh, uh, in the center was the creation of the World Wide Web. So it was created at CERN in 1989 by Tim Berners-Lee. And the goal of the World Wide Web was to help physicists in their daily life. So physicists have a lot of needs to uh, share data between themselves and to have a way to easily uh, access this data. So Tim Berners-Lee came up with this idea that we would have a, a standard set of protocols to access the data and to share it uh, with, with, with the colleagues. Um, so he came up with this proposal in 1989. And here's the screenshot of the actual initial proposal. And you can see a lot of blocks and things interconnected. This was the whole point of, uh, of uh, the endeavor. And uh, in 89, it, created, it get, got really popular inside CERN. But by 93, uh, the, center, the CERN had realized that this could be uh, a thing to be used by many more people than just, uh, just the CERN physicists. So they made it uh, available in the public domain. And of course, uh, it got really popular. We all know that's also why we are all here today. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we celebrated the 30th anniver anniversary of the World Wide Web. You have a picture here. Uh, we had a big party, and uh, there was a broadcast. And uh, you can see uh, Tim Berners-Lee there sitting with many other uh, famous people. But our main goal is still to do particle physics. And to do, to do this, we need a very, very large machines. So this is a picture of the, the, our current largest machine, which is the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, it's a big particle accelerator. It's the biggest scientific uh, experiment ever built. Um, and what you see here is the dipoles of the actual accelerator. And this is where we will accel we accelerate beams of protons uh, for the last few years. Uh, and to actually do this, it's very interesting because we have to cool them down so that the, uh, they, uh, the accelerator becomes superconducting. And actually, it's, it's the coolest place in the universe, literally, because we, we run this at 1.7 Kelvin, which is very close to the absolute zero. And here is more an overview of the whole system. So you can see that uh, the, the collider, so the big circle is the Large Hadron Collider. It's 27 kilometers in circumference. Um, it's uh, deep underground, 100 meters underground. Um, and what we do is we introduce two beams of protons. We inject them using initial accelerators that you can see smaller circles there. So we first start uh, speeding them up and increasing the energy. And when they are close to the speed of light, very close to the speed of light, then they are within the big accelerator. And we have two beams. One is going clockwise, and the other one is counter going counterclockwise. And at very specific points, we make them collide to each other. And we built these uh, big uh, detectors. Uh, we have here Alice, Atlas, LHGB, and CMS. 
And uh, this, uh, we'll, ha we'll see a picture. They, they try to analyze what, what the collisions are, are seeing. Uh, just for size, to have an idea of the size, you can see the Geneva Airport just there on the bottom right. Uh, and then you can see that it's actually a quite big machine. It spans two countries, uh, France and Switzerland. And inside the experiments, it, we try to see things like this. This is a, a visualization of what happens inside. And uh, when the particles uh, collide to each other, we try to make uh, what we could call a, a, pic, a photo of what's going on, although we use uh, uh, a lot of hardware for this. Uh, there are uh, uh, billions of collisions happening uh, uh, per second, and we are taking uh, for something that would be 40 million pictures a second uh, here. And this is a picture of the CMS detector. Uh, the CMS stands for compact muon solenoid, but it's not compact at all. It's uh, 14 tons. It's written there even. Uh, so it's a very big machine. The cavern is 40 meters by 40 meters. Again, 100 meters underground. You can see the, uh, a human in the middle, just to have an idea of the size. And this is what uh, we use as our camera. Uh, we have four of these, so you can see a picture here of the circle uh, of the, the accelerator. And you can see the four experiments, and we pull uh, ver uh, fast links, network links to our data center. So the white building there is the CERN data center. Uh, the machines are the, the detectors are generating an order of petab uh, petabytes a second, and we can't uh, deal with this. So what we do, we we have hardware filters that will bring this down uh, quite significantly. Then we have subsequent software filters, and what we are actually storing is something like 10 gigabytes a second in in the data center, and that we can almost manage with the data center we have. We have something like 300,000 cores, and we can store uh, storage. We have like 400 petabytes today, but it's still not enough. So in the last 20 years, we developed what we call the grid. Uh, and there, we doubled the capacity. And how this works is we connected 200 different uh, centers around the world, universities and uh, other research labs. This doubled our capacity. If you look into it, you will see something like 400 or half, almost half a million jobs uh, running concurrently. And we are actually adding 70 new petabytes from, from the accelerator every year that we have to store and analyze. And this is the computing, and then I'll let Lucas cover the physics part. OK. So what we came here to KubeCon for is to demonstrate how we can use Kubernetes to analyze these large-scale scientific data sets, uh, such as the ones that we produce at the LHC. And so we also prepared a little live demo. And uh, we're going to try to rediscover the Higgs boson um, live on stage. And hopefully, that will work. And so uh, here on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the announcement of the discovery of the Higgs boson by both the Atlas and CMS experiment, and also the champagne that we drank. And then on the left-hand side, you can see Francois Angler and Peter Higgs, who in the next year, in 2013, were awarded the Nobel Prize in uh, physics uh, because due to that discovery, because they laid the theoretical foundation that uh, predicted this particle. To kind of explain why we're uh, so happy that we found this Higgs particle, I'll need to explain a little bit about the Higgs particle. So it's part of what we call the standard model of particle physics. It's the current theory that we use to um, compute uh, different interactions of fundamental particles, and it's very successful. So we can predict the outcome of uh, particle physics experiment to many, many decimal places. But uh, before we had the LHC, it, uh, it was a little bit of a puzzle, because on the one hand, we had this incredibly um, successful theory. And on, on the other hand, the same theory was predicting the existence of this new particle called the Higgs boson. And, uh, but we hadn't seen that yet. And uh, so the Higgs boson is a very special particle. It has uh, unique properties. It's unlike any other particle in the standard model. And the ex existence of this particle signals that we also understand why particles have mass and not everything is uh, zipping through the universe at the speed of light. So obviously, when we had the LHC, we went looking for it. And um, one of the issues uh, when looking for the Higgs boson is that it's uh, very short-lived. So it only lives for tenth of a billionth of a trillionth of a second. Right? And then it decays into other particles. So you can never actually uh, observe the Higgs directly, but we can only infer its existence through observing its decay products. So uh, in this demo, uh, we'll try to search. Uh, so the Higgs can decay in many ways. And we'll try to find it in uh, what's called the golden decay channel of the Higgs, where the Higgs decays into electrons and muons. And so this is the plot that we had during the publication when we discovered the Higgs particle. And we'll try to recreate this plot using Kubernetes. Uh, no. So uh, Ricardo will work on submitting. Yeah. 
uh, the workload. So we have a couple of clusters set up that Ricardo will explain later on. And I'll also set up the visualization. OK. okay. So I'm setting it now. OK. I'm Just let me check here. OK, so I have so all the results yeah. that we're going to talk about are uh, being aggregated um, are, are being aggregated uh, while the results are coming in. So we, I'm starting the notebook that does the up, a, aggregation. And as you can see here, the plot is empty right now. So it's not like the plot that we just saw on the slide before. But hopefully, while we're uh, talking, th these results will uh, come streaming in, and then we'll actually see the same result. Yeah. And if you watch quickly what's happening, so we can try to see, and I'll quickly, briefly explain. So what we are doing, maybe increase the phone. Uh, we are okay. showing here, so the, the submission is happening. Can you increase? Ah, yeah, it's OK. Right. Uh, the submission is happening. And what we are doing, we, we are tuning into the event API of Kubernetes, and we are seeing the events, the jobs. We have something like, I'll go into detail of how many things we are submitting. But here, we are listening into the job API. And you can see the different states that the jobs are in. Pulling means they are staging in the data. And then we already have a couple of running. And eventually, they will start succeeding. So this takes a bit. So while we wait for this, I'll give a brief uh, description of uh, what the demo is really about. Yep. yep. Okay. So in the data set we are analyze analyzing, it's the Higgs data set, and uh, it's 70 terabytes of data. Now, this uh, includes a lot of different pieces. We have simulation data, and we have then the real data. And the goal is that we will uh, try to process these 70 terabytes while we are standing here. and. We have to speed up the, the demo a bit. So uh, we have the event data that comes through a, a large, very large Kubernetes cluster. And each job will process a bit of this data set. So there's 25,000 files. Each file is between 3 and 4 gigabytes. And then they produce the output. And this output is what we use for the visualization while this, ha this is happening. So actually, and then these 25,000 files show a limitation that we have in this, in this demo which is we can only parallelize up to 25,000 parallel jobs. Because at the time, with the software is from 2010, it was single core. So the resources we are using at, at CERN, we have a cluster with a Ceph for storage. We have a 70 terabyte data set there. Then we have a Kubernetes cluster that we deploy in our internal infrastructure. And we push the data to Redis. And then from Redis, the results to, the, to Redis. And from Redis, we can do the visualization. The problem is that. CERN has a production infrastructure. And even during upgrade time, like now, we are all, always trying to max out the, the resource usage. So when we went and we asked for 25,000 cores for a demo, we did not get it. So we started asking around. And uh, we then uh, met some really nice people from, from Google. And we have this CERN Open Lab collaboration, which is the, the goal of this collaboration is to, to uh, work with industry partners. So Google is, is one of these uh, members of this collaboration. So we did the same. We ju just replicated the same. Um, uh, set up, but in the Google Cloud. So instead of Ceph for NS3, we have GCS. We have the 70 terabyte data set there. Then we have a large cluster managed by GKE. Uh, it's actually deployed in a single region, but we split it in three different uh, availability zones, which gives us a really, a really nice way to, to spread the load. Uh, we, we deploy the 25,000 Kubernetes jobs there. We push the job results to the equivalent of Redis, the cloud, uh, uh, Google Cloud me Memory Store. And then we visualize in Jupyter. And there's two things that I would like to highlight here. One is that we saw in the previous watch that uh, the, the scalability and, uh, of Kubernetes, because we can really submit all these jobs very quickly, and they go to scheduling and running quite quickly. And then the second one is that by developing the application using the Kubernetes API, we started by testing it at CERN. And then we didn't have enough resources. And then we went to the public uh, uh, cloud. And without changes, uh, the application just runs. So this is a, a, like major features for our community. OK, so we'll go back to the visualization. Hopefully, some results should be coming in. Yep. OK, there you go. OK, there's stuff happening. And so you see the plot updating in the clock. And so what's happening now, so as you see, as you see the plot was empty before. And now it's filling up slowly. And you see um, the black dots slowly uh, inching up. And the black dots are actually the data that we've observed at the LHC, like actual collisions. Right? And the, um, 
uh, color histogram, so the blue, light blue histogram and the red outline histogram, these are the computations that we have based on our theoretical understanding of the standard model. So this is the expectation, the prediction that the standard model gives us for what the data should look like. And as you can see, so in the middle around the value of 125, um, you see that there's a small bump forming that is not covered by this blue histogram. So everywhere else, the black dots pretty much agree with uh, the blue histogram. But in the middle there, um, you have a small bump. And uh, this is actually the existence of the Higgs uh, particle. So this proves its existence. Uh, because this plot, what we actually see, so what we do in these 25,000 uh, jobs, we uh, download uh, event data, and we go through these collisions, and we select events that have electrons and muons in them, because as I said, the Higgs is um, decaying into electrons and muons. And sometimes we uh, pick also events, obviously, where there's no original uh, Higgs boson. But uh, sometimes we also pick up events that actually have the Higgs boson. And so you see the um, peak is forming pretty nicely. We just found it. Right? So yeah, so we found the Higgs right? Uh, using 25,000 cores. It's pretty good. You can go to the stack yeah. driver. Yeah. OK, so uh, just to see that we're actually running a, a demo, we'll also go to the stack driver log page and see what the data rate is that we were pulling from the storage. As Ricardo explained, we were pulling from S3 storage in Google. And this should be updating. Yeah. OK. This is the slowest part of the right. demo. Okay. Yeah, there we go. So there you go. So I'll zoom in. And so this is pretty astonishing, right? So we had 25,000 jobs pulling data. And so you can see the total data rate that we were pulling from Google Storage was uh, almost 200 gigabytes a second. Right? This is multiple terabits uh, per second. And uh, so we were pretty amazed when we saw this. And so this actually allowed us to run this demo in real time. So we, saw, we started the demo uh, shortly after 5.40. And now uh, it's done. And so the, the data uh, pulling is also um, going down again. Yeah. And so I'll go I back to the slide yeah, we're done. and uh, talk a little bit about uh, what the implications are. Um, so, so this is the plot what, that we just uh, recreated in the span of a couple of minutes. And um, no, go back one. Yeah, yeah. So basically, so this is using open data that we are uh, making accessible uh, at CERN. So many of the experiments at CERN have an open data policy. And so in this case, we use the open data from the CMS experiment. And, but for these large scientific uh, applications or experiments, it has always been a little bit of an issue of while we can make our data available and dump petabytes of uh, data, it remained an open question how can people that don't have a data center like we have actually realistically run these types of applications um, on their own? Right? And so how can they actually uh, make use of this data and analyze it? And uh, using this uh, public cloud infrastructure, it actually turns out that anybody can try to rediscover the Higgs boson within a couple of minutes. OK, so I also wanted to talk a little bit about so software archiving and reproducibility. So as I said, the Higgs boson is, was discovered in 2012. But in this application, we actually use software from uh, 2010. And so this is root is our main uh, uh, data analysis application that we use at CERN. And so we are actually computing like it's 2010. And uh, this is all containerized into Docker containers. And uh, this allows us to really consistently uh, archive uh, scientific software applications uh, in a consistent way. So not only the software, so we make the data available, but also the software and also the software runtime so that we are only dependent on a very stable interface layer, which is the Unix kernel. So next. Yep. Right, so yeah, so containers basically give us reproducibility in space time. Right? So we can not only run uh, an application in a different data center today, but we can also run it uh, in the future and maybe reuse an application later on. So in my opinion, this has been a complete game changer for open science, at least for these large-scale um, scientific collaborations. OK, so uh, if you want to uh, learn more, maybe try it out yourself. You can also go to the uh, CERN Open Data uh, portal and uh, learn more about uh, what uh, experiments actually make data available. And Huge. Yes, so we uh, actually want to uh, just thank the entire uh, Kubernetes community. Um, this has been great for us. Yeah, thank you all. <laughs>